All right. So yesterday we talked about a couple of different things. Um, we primarily focused on naming ions. We talked about uh, drawing Lewis symbols or Lewis structures. Those two terms, think about them as being fairly interchangeable. Um, today we're going to expand on that topic. And this is titled covalent bonding because we're taking a deeper dive into covalent bonding. If you remember yesterday, we talked about both ionic bonding and ionic compounds, as well as covalent bonding and covalent compounds. Sometimes you'll hear the term uh, molecular compound, and you'll hear the terms molecular compound and covalent compounds. You'll hear those used interchangeably, and that's fine. Um, so that's something that is that you should kind of expect to encounter. Now, sorry, I'm adjusting just a second. Um, we're taking a deeper dive into covalent bonding because what we're going to do is we're going to, or one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to look at the periodic table again. And we're going to investigate this concept known as electronegativity. So, Electronegativity is a phenomenon or it's a, a property of an individual atom. And essentially it is how much does an atom want electrons. Now, this is particularly important with respect to covalent bonding, because if you remember when we talked about covalent ionic bonding, um, covalent bonding is the sharing of electrons. And let me just toggle back for a second. So sharing electrons between atoms. And I I bring this up just because this is compared to, or I'll say versus, ionic bonding, where E electrons are transferred or donated or lost. So if Remember when we talked about sodium chloride? Well, sodium gave up an electron. Chlorine accepts that electron, and they make an ionic compound. When we talk about covalent bonding, we're talking about sharing of electrons. Now, this phenomenon or this property, electronegativity, the question of how much does an electron want or how much does an atom want electrons, I want to draw your attention to this word right here that I inadvertently un underline slash cross through. How much? When you hear about or when you think about much, I mean, if you think uh, much or many, you're thinking about a quantity. So a, a magnitude. So how much does, uh, I don't know, how much, how much do I want a Tesla? Eh, I get I could kind of take it or leave it. How much do I want a Ferrari? I want a Ferrari so much that I will give $5,000 to the Ferrari dealership. Of course, they're not going to give me that Ferrari if I give them $5,000, but I can quantify it. Electronegativity is a quantifiable measure of how much does a given atom want an electron. And if you look at this table we've got a color coding and a color scheme that basically shows the most versus least here over or over here we have fluorine fluorine is teal and this is an interesting display of a periodic table because we have nine for our atomic number and then this number 3.98 that is the measure of electronegativity. This is known as the Pauling scale 
of electronegativity scale, not sale, S-C-A-L-E. <clears throat> this is named in honor or in recognition of uh, Linus Pauling, who was a chemist, physicist. He was kind of a jack of all trades, uh, brilliant person. Um, and he won the Nobel Prize in the 30s. Then he won the Nobel Peace Prize, I think, in the 50s. And he just made tremendous strides in science and in chemistry. Um, he, at one point, had what was the popularized idea or structure of a DNA molecule. Ultimately, his, his theorized structure was disproven. Um, but he, you know, a brilliant person. So he came up with this Pauling scale of electronegativity, which ranges from approximately... Sorry, where are we? Okay. 0 0.7 to 3.98 or 4. The lower the number, lower number means less electronegative. So if something is less electronegative, it wants electrons less. Now, if we think about this in the context of our types of bonding, sodium has an electronegativity of 0 0.93. Cl has an electronegativity of 3.16. The differences of these electronegativities are so great that sodium isn't going to try to share an electron with chlorine. It's simply just going to give it up, which is what we already kind of theorized with our idea of ionic bonding with a metal and a non-metal coming together. Now, what this tells us is, I, I always try to think about this and what we'll mostly focus on are elements, basically your non-metal elements. So on the right side of the line that I just drew there, but we'll also rope into this hydrogen from time to time. Now, will proceed and we can classify these electronegativity differences and classify bonds. So this is a table that you can expect to see. And this basically gives us a measure of bond polarity. So I would like you to think about this almost as strength. The higher the number, the stronger an atom is. The stronger pull that an electron has, or that an atom has for a given electron. The lower number, the weaker it is. Now, we can classify covalent bonds as being nonpolar covalent or as polar covalent. Nonpolar covalent bonds are what they have is bonding electrons are shared equally. They have an electronegativity difference between, or less than, 0 0.5. So I want to show you H, H, hydrogen gas, or H2. If you remember, H2, or hydrogen gas, was one of our diatomic elements. So it loves to pair up with one of its own. So hydrogen loves to find another hydrogen and form H2, or hydrogen gas. Now, in order to calculate the electronegativity differences, what we're going to do is we're going to take our two numbers. So the electronegativity for hydrogen is 2.1. This line right here represents our bond, or our two shared electrons. And I'm going to figure out which of these two atoms wants those electrons more. So I'm going to say 2.1 minus 2.1. Then I'm going to do something that maybe it's been a minute since you've seen this, but I'm going to put a vertical line and another vertical line. Those two vertical lines indicate an absolute value. And I'll show you why this is important in just a little while. But essentially what we have is 2.1 minus 2.1 and I think everyone can do that calculation and figure out that it is 
zero. <clears throat> so what that tells you, what that value says is that the difference between the electronegativity of these two atoms is zero. Each one of these atoms is pulling those shared electrons equally. So it's almost like H2 has a game of tug of war going and nobody's winning that game because no one is stronger than the other one. Now, if we look at, so basically you can classify anything where the atoms are the same as a nonpolar covalent bond. So HH, FF, those are nonpolar covalent bonds. Now CH, that presents a different story. So let's look at this and we'll look at it in two different ways. I'll do C, H, and then I'll also do H, C. So the electronegativity for carbon is 2.5. And an absolute value, 2.5 minus 2.1. Okay, so 2.5 minus 2.1 is 0 0.4. This shows that these two atoms don't have an equal sharing. However, is that unequal sharing extreme? Well, the question then is, what's the measure? The electronegativity difference is less than 0 0.5. So that tells me that although there is a difference, it's not significant enough to really, you know, it's, it's not that significant of a difference. <laughs> Anything that is 0 0.5 or greater is a significant difference. Okay, so now let's look at this from the standpoint of 2.1 minus 2.5. Well, 2.1 take away 2.5 would give you a negative number, but this is an absolute value. So despite that being a negative number, so I'll write negative 0 0.4, but since this is an absolute value, I'm going to switch that to a positive. Your absolute value is the absolute difference, though what it doesn't account for positive or negative. It just says what is the magnitude difference there. So essentially what this tells us is that a carbon-hydrogen bond or a hydrogen-carbon bond, they're interchangeable, or you can use those two terms interchangeably. Um, the differences between those two yeah, they are, they are different, but they are not so different that they go beyond uh, or go outside of the uh, realm of being a nonpolar covalent bond. So these are both, or these three that are indicated here are all examples of nonpolar covalent bonds. So if we go back up to look at H2 and F2. Again, we talked about a series of our diatomic elements. H. Broncliff. We said H. B. R. O. N. C. L. I. F. Two. 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 These are all diatomic elements. Okay, mm -hmm. so those are all nonpolar covalent bonds between those two. Then, if we go on from there, other differences or other um, types of bonds, we classify them as polar covalent. So, a polar covalent bond is where bonding electrons are shared unequally. Okay, now let's look back. H and C. Well, those are unequally, but their difference is a very small difference. So that's an insignificant difference. Our polar covalent bonds are where electrons are shared unequally. When our electronegativity difference ranges from 0 0.5 to 2.0. So again, we take these atoms, electronegativities, and let's go with one that's not on here. Uh, let's go with H, C, L. H is 
minus CL, which is 3.0, 0 0.9. That is an example of a polar covalent bond. Because these two atoms are shared unequally, and our electronegativity difference falls between 0 0.5 and 2.0. OH. Well, OH is 3.5 minus 2.1. <clears throat> and that equals 1.4. Well, that falls within 0 0.5 and 2.0. So that is an example of a polar covalent bond. Now, if we want to, we can look at something, let's say Cl and K. K, Cl. That is a substance that based on what we talked about yesterday i'd expect you to be able to deduce that name or translate that formula into the name that's potassium the potassium ion and the chloride ion so that is potassium chloride now by seeing that this is a metal and a non-metal you're probably thinking well this is an ionic compound 0.8 minus 3.0, that would be 2.2 as our electronegativity difference. That goes beyond being a polar covalent bond. <clears throat> I always kind of think about this as anything greater than, so a electronegativity difference of greater than 2.0 is an ionic bond. So this is an ionic bond. We have nonpolar covalent, polar covalent, and ionic. Those are our three classes of bonds. So sometimes you can look at the, the formula and see, oh, well, that's a metal and a nonmetal. Okay, the metal and a nonmetal make up an ionic compound. So chances are it's gonna be an ionic bond. This table, gives you the specific values where you can do that sort of calculation and say, okay, what is this based on quantifying it? And you can figure that out. So this right here, what we're looking at with these numbers is we're not looking to classify compounds. We're looking to classify specific bonds. So if I gave you something like, or if you're trying to think of like, oh, well, CH4 as an example, well, you have to know what that molecule looks like and what types of, which atoms are bonded to one another in order to answer what is the polarity of the different bonds. Now, we're not going to do a poll here, but which of these bonds is most polar? Okay, let's go process of elimination. Well, H and H, that is out because those two atoms have the exact same electronegativity. C and H, our difference here, well, that's going to be 0 0.4 because it's 2.5 minus 2.1. C and F, that's 2.5 minus 4.0, but it's an absolute value, so our difference is 1.5. C and CL, our difference here is 0 0.5. So we are left with C, C and F. Now, again, I'll give you this table, or I'll give you these values right here. What I'm not going to give you are these definitions. So I do have an expectation that you know these differences. And so one thing that I want to highlight to you is this right here. This is greater than 2. Does it include 2? It does not. Because a difference or an electronegativity difference of two is included for our definition of a polar covalent bond. Our electronegativity of difference of 0 0.5. Well, that is also included in a polar covalent bond. So keep these straight. One simple way to put it is if it's less than 0 0.5, it's nonpolar covalent. If it's greater than two, it's ionic. If it's not 
uh, non-polar covalent or ionic, then it is a polar covalent bond. Now, this is a good question that I'd likely ask you for these different representations of bond polarity. We did this just a moment ago where we looked at the, the difference between H and F, and we found that H, or we did HCl, I'm sorry, but let's go ahead and throw the numbers in here. H is 2.1, F is 4.0. So 2.1, 4.0. Okay. Remember what I said, the more electronegative element has the larger mm -hmm. number. So that wants electrons more. Now, what that ultimately kind of shakes out as is something like this. We have HF. And we have these symbols right here. These two symbols, this kind of snake looking structure is delta, delta positive, delta negative. These indicate partial charges. So partial negative or positive. So we depict, whenever we draw an atom, we put this partial negative symbol over the more electronegative element. This partial positive symbol, or this delta positive symbol, over the less electronegative element. Then, over here, we have another way of depicting that with this arrow. This arrow is not really, it's not stylistically drawn. Instead, I always draw it with the arrow pointed towards the more electronegative element. And then there's this little hash mark here to indicate the more positive symbol. I always visualize this as, I'm going to change colors for just a second. I've effectively put the positive over my more elect or my less electronegative element, the arrowhead over my more electronegative element. So that's what I'm ending up with, with the arrow symbol as well as the um, delta symbols. The last model right here, these all kind of follow the same trend where our electronegative element or our more electronegative element is on the right-hand side, fluorine, and then on the left-hand side is our electro less electronegative element. The more electronegative element has this kind of big red sphere surrounding it, whereas my less electronegative element has this slightly smaller blue sphere surrounding it. So this is ultimately what I'm looking for with respect to the... Uh, depiction. So I've got one, two, and three different ways of depicting the electronegativity and the bond polarity of a given bond. So my arrow is going to be, excuse me, my arrow head will be towards my less or my more electronegative element. The positive or the opposite end of my arrow is going to be towards my less electronegative element. The delta negative is closer to my more electronegative element. My delta positive closer to my less electronegative element. My less electronegative element gets the blue sphere, whereas my more electronegative element gets my red sphere. So these are the three different models to represent bond polarity. Now, one thing I think that's useful to think about is, all right, well, what if I don't have a polar bond? <clears throat> well, that's a great question. If you don't have a polar bond, this second one, you're not really gonna be able to come up with it because you don't have those partial negative or partial positive regions. So that one's out. Similarly, model number one, that's not going to work because you're not going to have a partial positive or a partial negative end. 
The third one, you can kind of come up with that and it would look a little bit like this. So I'll draw H, H. You'll have something that basically looks like this. Two equally sized uh, spheres surrounding those hydrogen atoms. So you can come up with it and that's effectively what it would look like. Now, here what we have are a total of three different structures drawn in a couple of different ways. We have water, ammonia, and methane. Now, these are uh, common names for these compounds. One thing that I want to stress to you is that ammonia and the cleaning material ammonium are different from one another. Water, well, that's just water. So that's nothing special or anything like that. Um, but what these models show are going to be um, the most likely Lewis structures or Lewis dot structures that result from these compounds. Water is H2O. Ammonia is N. H3, methane is CH4. Now, when you look at water, we have two electrons right here, two electrons right here. The, those two, what are known as bonded pairs of electrons, correspond to that bond and this bond. These two lone pairs of electrons are around our more electronegative element. And it's also important to remember that the octet rule is still in effect. Each atom wants to have a total of eight electrons surrounding it. Nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, and carbon all want to have eight electrons around it. There are some exceptions. Hydrogen and helium are both atoms that want to have two electrons around them. Now this hydrogen right here has these two electrons, and this hydrogen has these two electrons. This oxygen, by contrast, <clears throat> has these electrons, these electrons, these electrons, and these electrons. It's sharing those electrons. Now, what we're going to be getting into now are known as polyatomic molecules. So, and polyatomic ions. These polyatomic molecules, well, they consist of multiple atoms. Water has three different atoms or three atoms. Ammonia has four, as does methane have five atoms. Now, when it comes to these polyatomic molecules, there are some trends that you can be familiar with and comfortable with, with respect to the number of bonds that they like to form. Hydrogen really likes to form a single bond because then it gets to share two electrons. It's not always going to be an equal sharing of these two electrons, but it's going to be a sharing nonetheless. Now, I mentioned the octet rule, and I mentioned some exceptions to the octet rule. Hydrogen is one. Helium, we've previously talked about, is happy with two electrons. Beryllium and boron are also exceptions to the octet rule. That's because these two atoms, beryllium and boron, like to form two and three bonds respectively. Beryllium likes to do this, B, E, F, and F. It likes to form that, in which case we've got a compound that is B, E, F, 2. Now I chose fluorine intentionally because let's look at what fluorine likes to do. Fluorine likes to, coming over here to 7A, Fluorine really likes to form one bond. It likes to share a total of two electrons. So essentially what that means is this model of fluorine is kind of incomplete because 
Although beryllium is happy, fluorine is not quite happy. Now, how can I make it happy? By erasing those and instead adding electron, 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 electron. Okay, so all told, this is, let's, I want to count up these electrons because this is the sort of thing, like this table right here, the better you know this table, the better off you're going to be for your exam when it comes to uh, looking at structures and counting up electrons. So I'm going to count up the total number of electrons in this compound right here. Here's two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. So this has a total of 16 electrons. Now, if we think back to numbers of valence electrons, well, fluorine, each fluorine atom is bringing in seven valence electrons. And each beryllium is bringing in two valence electrons. So if we took our two fluorines and said two times seven, and to that added the number of electrons from beryllium, which is two, that's gonna get us to 16 electrons. So this is a little bit of a, what's it called, reverse engineering. We drew the structure, then we looked back, and we, but we could do this in a similar way where we added up the total number of valence electrons that each atom brings to the table, and then try putting the structure together based on that. So I'm gonna erase all of this, and we're gonna work on doing the exact same thing, and we're gonna do it with B for boron. Boron likes to form one, two, three bonds. We're going to make BCL3. So that's one boron and three chlorines. Okay, let's do our electron calculation. One boron brings in three electrons. Each of our three chlorines, so this is going to be three plus three times seven. Three plus 21 equals 24. So now let's go ahead and draw our structure. B, Cl, Cl, Cl. I'll draw one, two, three, four, five, six. So this chlorine is good. It looks like this chlorine right here. Boom, 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 boom. Now the next one looks like this right here. And then the next one. <clears throat> Done. Booyah. Okay, so each boron looks like the boron that's in the table here. And then each chlorine looks like the chlorine in the table. So now, how many total electrons have we drawn? Two, four. I'm just going to do a one by each one of them. Four, six, eight. 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24. 24 electrons, which is what we calculated that we would need to draw. And this gives us what we're ultimately putting together. <clears throat> I would use this structure or these structures here to think about all of the different compounds that you can kind of come up with. So if we think about something like, um, let's see, if we're trying to put together a structure with nitrogen and fluorine, well, fluorine likes to form one bond, nitrogen 
likes to form three bonds. Okay, so that gives us a good ratio to start out with, where we'd have to come up with one nitrogen, three fluorines. If you were like, okay, well, what about silicon, SI? Silicon and more silicon. Well, that likes, it's almost like you don't have an end piece. You don't have a bookend here. So you could make silicon on silicon and silicon and silicon and silicon and silicon. But where's, you're just going to have this network of bonded silicon atoms that go together. So you wouldn't really be able to say like NF3 or NCL3 or PCL3 or anything like that. Okay. So the better that you know this table, the better off you're going to be with respect to your exam on Monday. Now, we also have to come up with names for each one of these compounds. For instance, back here, BCL3, what do we call that? Boron and chlorine. Boron and three chlorine, perfect, that's a great name. It's not, I'm sorry. It's not a good name, it's not a, I mean, it's descriptive, but it doesn't follow the naming conventions that chemists use. When it comes to naming compounds, chemists have a scheme that we use for um, polyatomic molecules that are covalent compounds. So CO, that is carbon monoxide. NO2 is nitrogen dioxide. N2O, two nitrogens and one oxygen dinitrogen monoxide. Okay, now let's look at these two right here. Nitrogen dioxide and dinitrogen monoxide. <clears throat> For the nitrogen dioxide, how many nitrogens do we have? One. How many oxygens do we have? Two. We use the prefix to indicate the number provided that it is not one, okay? So here our rule, we could kind of look at this and say, all right, well, as long as we have just one nitrogen, we don't need to say mononitrogen, okay? That passes that marking. Okay, now next up, we've got dinitrogen. Okay, that means we have two nitrogens. Okay, cool, so we're gonna use the prefix there to indicate two, dinitrogen, monoxide oh but wait a minute that the rule that we just cooked up for nitrogen dioxide seems out of sync with dinitrogen monoxide it is but it isn't okay what's the difference between these two what's the difference between these two compounds where the substance where there is only one of them uses or doesn't use the prefix well, the difference is that nitrogen was the first element that was mentioned, the first element that was used. So if the substance, if the, um, basically the first atom, you do not use auto. Do you indicate how many of them there are? You do, if it's more than one. So dinitrogen, or if it was trinitrogen or tetranitrogen or something like that, you would indicate that. But if it's just one of them, you do not need to indicate mononitrogen or dinitrogen or anything like that. Next up is going from the name to the formula. Carbon. Okay, so there's one carbon, dioxide. That would be CO, I'm going to correct this, CO2. Should be a subscript. Okay, next up, dihydrogen. Okay, so our first element is hydrogen. We've got two, monoxide, H2O. So that's ultimately going to be our formula for water. 
Now, this is something that uh, I've seen happen over the years a couple of times. There's always like some intrepid or some clever uh, high schooler who will, you know, realize that water is also known as dihydrogen monoxide. And they'll put up like banners at their grocery store or at their high school, ban, banning, suggesting that people ban dihydrogen monoxide. And they'll say stuff like dihydrogen, mon uh, dihydrogen monoxide is potentially fatal when ex exposed in extreme amounts. And you're right, it is. It's called drowning. Um, but that's always the, the thing that someone will bring up as like a, a scare tactic or a fear tactic. And, you know, when you hear dihydrogen monoxide, it sounds like, oh, I've heard, I've heard monoxides before. I've heard that phrase before. And it's always been in a movie where people die. Water doesn't really strike that same level of fear. At any rate, my point is, of all of this right here, is for our first atom, we're not going to use the prefix if there's just one of that substance. Nitrogen dioxide. Okay, so that's nitrogen and oxygen. There's two oxygens. We're going to label this as NO2. Dinitrogen monoxide. There's nitrogen and oxygen. There's two nitrogens, so N2 monoxide is O, so N2O. All right, now this right here, what's the formula for phosphorus trichloride? Okay, so this is one that the first two answers, let's see if we can eliminate some of them. We've got phosphorus. And maybe you reach a point where you're like, I can't remember if it's phosphorus or if it's potassium that has a P or a K. Those are the two that people get mixed up from time to time. Trichloride. Okay. What do I know? I know that there are three chlorines. So I'm going to remove A because this three, this subscript corresponds to this element right here. I know that D is off the table because there are, again, three chlorides. So at this point, it's to get this one right, you have to arrive at, well, P is phosphorus. K is potassium. People get those mixed up just because, well, potassium does not start with the letter K. It starts with the letter P. But they mix those, people mix those two up from time to time. Now, just as I said that there are polyatomic or yeah, polyatomic molecules, there are polyatomic ions. So an ion is something that has a charge, a negative or a positive charge. These are all examples of polyatomic ions. Ammonium. I mentioned this earlier to compare it to ammonia. <laughs> Ammonium has a charge of NH4 plus. Now, this table right here, I don't expect you to memorize these. I don't need you to memorize them. Um, but these are what are known as common polyatomic ions. They all have unique names. So if we look at cyanide, cyanide is carbon and nitrogen, one carbon, one nitrogen with a negative charge. If you're thinking about this and using this sort of this rule set right here, you would probably call it carbon mononitrogen. But remember, it has a negative charge, so it's not going to be carbon mononitrogen. Instead, this is the cyanide ion, or CN minus. <clears throat> now, these compounds can be used to form, or these polyatomic ions can be used to form compounds. So... If we look at NaOH, that is a compound that is, and this table right here, I will give this to you as a part of your questions on your next exam. NaOH, what you need to do in order to come up with the name for this is to recognize the parts. So this is sodium, then OH, Where is it? 
right here. OH minus. So this is sodium <coughs> hydroxide. Next up, this NH4NO3. You have to be able to recognize the parts of this. So this is NH4NO3. That's ammonium right here, NH4, and then NO3 minus nitrate. So this is ammonium nitrate. After that, you have taking the name and converting that name to the formula. Ammonium is going to be NH4. <clears throat> and this is kind of tricky because what you have to do is put together this full name. Ammonium chloride, NH4 plus. What is the charge for chloride? That would be Cl minus. So that'd be NH4 Cl. Lead to nitrate. Okay, so lead is Pb. And this indicates that we have a plus two charge. Okay, lead to nitrate. We jump back, we'll see that nitrate, which I kind of scribbled over. I apologize for that, everyone. Oh, clear this. Nitrate right here is NO3 minus. So this is where we can take those charges, Pb plus 2, NO3 minus. This plus 2, the 2 is going to be a subscript. The minus 1 is going to be a subscript for the lead. Okay, But where this gets complicated is for that NO3. If you were to say Pb, NO3, 2. Well, that looks like NO3 or NO32. That's incorrect. What you need to express here is that this is one lead, Pb plus plus, NO3 minus, and NO3 minus. So how do we express that we have two NO3s like this? Pb NO3, we use parentheses to indicate that. So then we have PbNO3, and we put a 2 outside of that parentheses. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead, and that's going to wrap it up today. Um, this covers, there's basically the highlights from today are we talked about electronegativity, and that plays into bond polarity and classification of bonds. So I'll give you a table like this. I won't give you the details on the electronegativity differences, but I'll give you a table that shows these specific values. I'll give you, I'll always give you the table of values that you need for electronegativities. Um, then what I'm also going to, do, so then we also talked about representations of bond polarity. How do we look at a um, a polar covalent bond or a non-polar covalent bond? What would that look like? Could we look at it this way or this way? Then Lewis structures of polyatomic molecules. Where are the bonded pairs of electrons and where are the lone pairs of electrons? Then we use this table right here to basically kind of look at a molecule and say, what are the building blocks that we can use to assemble a molecule? What are molecules that can easily be assembled and what are molecules that are a little bit trickier to be assembled? This also highlighted a total of three substances that have exceptions that are exceptions to the octet rule. If you look down at the bottom here, mercury, Hg, is also an exception to the octet rule. Um, and it's no different from beryllium in terms of what it can pair up with but excuse me it would just be redundant to say like oh hgf2 it's the same thing as bef2 
Uh, that's the only reason I didn't go into that. Um, and then last but not least, naming. What are the naming conventions? You're not going to identify the first atom with mono. The second atom, absolutely. The first atom, if there, if there are three of them, yeah, you will. We saw that with dinitrogen monoxide versus nitrogen dioxide. Then polyatomic ions. I will give you these polyatomic ions for the purposes of converting from a formula to a name and a name to a formula. Um, the biggest thing here is coming up with a nice model or depicting an atom with a nice model like this where you say, okay, I know how many of these things there are. And then remembering, you got to put these uh, parentheses out there. If you don't put the parentheses out there, then your three is not a three. It's a 32 or something like that, or a 33 or something like that. But I think that'll about wrap it up for today. If anyone has any questions, I'm going to stop my recording now. Um, 